the Appropriations Committee is fully aware of how deep the cuts are right now. But dipping into the rainy day fund alone is not going to be the solution. Once you decide to use it, it's a matter of you know, what do you prioritize. Still huge drastic cuts to public debt. The state will be able to pay their bills the rest of this buying. Is this just about trying to prevent a financial embarrassment? Budget breakdown, money meltdown. Over the week, thousands of teachers rallied at the state capitol, urging lawmakers to dip into the rainy day fund. As Texas faces a future budget shortfall projected as high as $27 billion, those teachers, like so many other people who depend on state money, might now get what they want. Lawmakers say closing a $4.3 billion gap now might mean fewer cuts around the corner. This morning, our On Politics panel looks at the behind-the-scenes battle for this money and why Texans should consider consider this a one-time move. Plus, two men who helped make that decision, Representatives Warren Chisholm and Mike Villarreal, talk rainy day and redistricting next on Session 11. From KXAN Austin News, this is Session 11. Live interactive breakdowns, insights, interviews, and our weekly roundtable discussion. You're watching Session 11 on KXAN Austin News. Good morning, I'm Josh Hinkle. Thanks for joining us for Session 11. What a tense week at the State Capitol as the House Appropriations Committee made the first move to dip into the rainy day fund this session. The governor's long been against it, but has slowly warmed up to the idea of using it to help plug a hole in our current budget. However, he and most Republican lawmakers agree it should absolutely stop there. This morning, our On Politics poll asks, should lawmakers dip into the fund for the next budget cycle? It's something to think about considering the massive have proposed cuts to government spending across the board. Also this morning, you'll want to log on to KXAN.com, and while you're there, click on the On Politics tab at the top. You'll go straight to our special political site where you can find our latest coverage and blogs, plus click the blue box at the top to chat with us this morning. We're talking immigrant, we're actually talking the rainy day fund and budget. Our On Politics panel will field your questions later in the program. Now we've learned one of the reasons the House Appropriations Committee decided to use the $3.2 billion of the rainy day fund now is to lessen the cuts to areas like education and Medicaid in the future. Our newsmakers would know they're both on that committee. Representative Mike Villarreal is a Democrat from San Antonio serving his sixth term in the House. Along with appropriations, he's vice chair of the redistricting committee and also serves on Ways and Means. Representative Warren Chisholm is a Republican from Pampa. He's been a member of the Texas House since 1989. He sits on appropriations and is a former chair of that committee, along with serving on the Environmental Regulation Committee. I asked them what was happening with the governor's people during this process. No shows during some hearings and deals. Villarreal's called rotten. In my opinion, what was happening uh, behind the scenes was that we were talking with the governor's office and we were discussing what their um, remedy was for our issues out there. And uh, we finally arrived, uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, and the, and the controller, uh, we finally arrived at a deal that we thought we could come in and use $3.2 billion out of the rainy day fund, pay this year's bills. Uh, we can do that uh, in, in concert with how the rainy day fund was established. We've got plenty of money for that. Keep the cuts in place and let's, uh, let's move forward. And we have an additional $4.3 billion to spend on nursing homes, on, on caseload, on, on schools, on colleges, and we will do that. So. The economy of Texas is going to do just fine, and anybody who wants to pay more taxes, I got the list of states that charge more taxes than we do, mm -hmm. and some of them that's raised their taxes. I don't think you are to raise taxes in tough economic times. What do you think was happening? I think what was happening is they're willing to use the rainy day fund to cover their, to save their political careers and save themselves from embarrassment of not paying their bills this year. But they're unwilling to use the rainy day fund to save our schools and our seniors' nursing homes. Was it a political move on anyone's part? Absolutely not. We're, you know, some nursing homes won't make it. There's, that's an absolute fact. But that's not the reason for government to be here. We're here to, to have a tax system and a, and a system that, that benefits the people. And there's many people in nursing homes, but there's also a significant number of people out there that actually do not have a job. There's businessmen out there that are just struggling to get by and to raise taxes on them in these tough economic times is just not the right See, but thing we're to not do. But talking about raising taxes, we're talking about using the rainy day fund. The rainy day fund is a fund that exists today. It is estimated to have 
$1.3 billion in it, and my colleagues are willing to use it to avoid embarrassing themselves and saving their political careers, but they're not willing to use that fund in order to save our schools and our seniors' nursing homes. And that is irresponsible. Is anyone going to try to bring up using the rainy day fund in the next budget? Not me. I believe the Senate will. Really? Yes. I mean, what's interesting is that this press release that came out from the governor's office and the speaker's office and the comptroller's office was interesting because the lieutenant governor was missing. <laughs> and if you read more closely, um, the governor didn't say he would veto a bill that uses the rest of the rain day fund. So I'm, I'm afraid, you know, they're just playing games with us. And we really need to roll up our sleeves and get down to work of passing a responsible budget that covers the basic public necessities like educating our children. So you've said that you are committed to stay on through the session, but then there might be the possibility of railroad commission after that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Michael Williams has, has indicated he's going to resign from the railroad commission. There's going to be a seat there. Um, there's uh, uh, Representative uh, Commissioner Jones has indicated she might run for the U.S. Senate. Uh, so I think there's going to be an opportunity there. And unfortunately, in my legislative district, um, it's one of those that did not grow as fast as the rest of the state. And so uh, there's, there's, a, there's a shortage of people in the Texas Panhandle compared to the rest of the state. So some of us that live and work and represent people up there are going to have to change what we do. I think it's a great opportunity to me to go to the Railroad Commission because I've earned my living for the last 50 years in the production of oil and gas. So I think I have some expertise to bring to that field. Mm -hmm. What he was just saying about some of those West te Texas districts, do you feel like we're going to have a legislature of the future that's too many urban members? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They seem to spin. Uh, <laughs> well, you're the I, what else to say? I don't know what else to say. You're the Absolutely not. <laughs> you're the redistricting vice chair. I mean, what kind of trends are you seeing with what members are talking about they want? You know, we, we need to make sure that our legislative districts reflect the demographics of the state. The state has become more diverse. It has become more urban and metropolitan. And so naturally, to respect the one person, one vote principle, you have to redraw these districts and you have to draw them where the people are. And right now, uh, that is primarily in the metropolitan areas. And so I think what you're going to see is a reduction of state reps in West Texas, East Texas, rural East Texas, and even in rural South Texas. We don't need vast amounts of people to pick cotton or gather potatoes. We have mechanized machinery where a person doing a thousand acres of cotton can do it with two people, and then it doesn't ever have to hire anybody else. And so we we see agriculture taking advantage of the technology that's out there, being able to do more with less. But the economy of the state depends a, to a great deal on the agricultural production of the state, and so not letting them have some representation for their economic output is just going to hurt this state in the future. It, you know, this is interesting because I, I, we disagree. Our world views are different. And uh, I, well, the way I see it is uh, most of the economy is determined by what's happening in Dallas, in Fort Worth, in San Antonio, in Houston, in McAllen, in El Paso, in our big cities. Uh, how those cities are doing economically is how the state is faring. All of the economic activity, just about all of it, is happening in our metropolitan areas where people live, where they are creating new ideas, inventing new technologies, and creating the next wave of quality jobs. We need to make sure that the uh, Texas legislature is a reflection of that reality. They don't produce one particle of food and fiber, and that's the basis of society. You well, have to have food and yeah. fiber or none of your technology will work because we you used can't. To. We used to. Uh, the cities are the historic place of agriculture. When land became too expensive, we moved that out to rural areas. And so as the needs of the cities change, we turn to our rural areas to do things in a less expensive way. But all of the ideas and the inventions agriculturally have happened 
where people congregate, where they exchange ideas, and, and that happens in cities. Now it goes on like that for nearly another hour. Everything from saving our community colleges at risk of closing to schools obtaining parental consent before teaching students about human sexuality. We have the entire conversation streamed on our websites, kxan.com and on politics.com. Plus, there's still more to come here on Session 11. Are you lusting after my precincts? <laughs> when you hear that, you know it's a legislative session. More redistricting rivalry. Predictions over how seats from right here in Central Texas might shake up. Next, when our newsmaker debate continues. Stay with us.